so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. John 5, verse number 16. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now listen, when Jesus makes this statement, my father, that was enough for them. They understood what Jesus was claiming. They understood the prophecy that was being fulfilled, that Jesus was who he was saying that he was. Now, we'll see that Jesus takes it a step farther here in a minute, but their accusation is that when you say my father, you're saying if God is your father, then you are making yourself equal with God. That's what, Jesus equals God. That's what they were hearing him saying. And listen, God equals the father. We know that, but they're separate and distinct. Now, we know that the, there's also separations we're going to see in this chapter between the Son of Man and the Son of God. We're going to see distinctions between the Father and the Son because the Father is not the Son, and we'll see that clearly. But more importantly, what Jesus tries to make this distinction, He says, My Father, as soon as He points to God in, in heaven, they get angry. They want to kill Him. They literally want to kill Him forsaking that, right? He said, because making Himself equal with God. That's the accusation. If, if Jesus is God, then he is equal with God. And they had a problem with that. They understood that he was saying that he's the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the, the Redeemer, uh, the King of Israel. Like There are so many different great titles for the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, in the Bible, every word matters. Yea, every letter matters. Right? You go to the hotel... And you, there's, oh, there's a Bible in here. They must be Christian owners at the hotel, right? Not really, okay. That's a Gideon Bible, and you say, I wonder if it's an authentic Bible. How do you know if it's an authentic Bible? Well, it's easy. You go to the first page, and it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There's only one Bible that says that. The rest of them say the heavens and the earth. Well, now, what, what does one letter change? It's not that big of a deal. Well, it is. When you actually see a different timeline of creation, it was different days that he created the other heavens, the, the sky that the birds fly in. That's called a heaven in the Bible. And the, 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 where the cosmos, where the stars are at, that's also called a heaven, created on a different day. So every other Bible contradicts itself, and every letter matters, every word matters. And listen, every title of God matters. There's something for us to learn about the nature of God and uh, through the distinctions of the titles that God uses for himself in his word. And of course, they, they say, uh, you, what did he say? He says, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. They were angry that by claiming that God was his father, he made himself equal with God. Jesus was saying, I am God in a sense. And famously, we know that in uh, Philippians 2, 6, it says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He is God. He was God. He's still God. And they had a big problem with that. I want to jump ahead real quick. Look at verse 24. John chapter 5, verse 24, another great famous verse. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Continue in verse 25. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Now, verily means truly. This is a matter of fact. When God says verily, he means this is a fact. You can put it in the bank, right? He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Now, this is very interesting. He's referring to the resurrection. Later in this chapter, he gets into the resurrection of the just, right? The resurrection unto life. The resurrection and those that will be resurrected unto damnation. This is a very important doctrine here. But Jesus is calling himself by a title, the Son of God. This is distinct. When, he, when Jesus calls himself the Son of God, this is very important in Acts uh, 13, he says, God hath fulfilled the same unto us and their children in that he raised up Jesus again 
as it is also written in the second Psalm, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. I want you to understand, uh, and what I want to talk about primarily for a minute is the difference between the son of man versus the son of God. Now, at the simplest form, Man is mankind or human flesh. We get that. And God obviously is a creator and deity and the one that makes souls and the one that judges souls. So there is an easy separation to make that the Son of God deals with Jesus' deity, his Godhead, and that the Son of Man deals with the flesh, the man Christ Jesus that walked the earth and did all these miracles. So in a simple way, we can make this distinction. And the Bible makes that distinction, but it's actually deeper than that. And listen, I don't want to make this more complicated than it is, and I don't want to oversimplify it e either, right? The Bible is like a scalpel, and I do want to rightly divide on this doctrine. And I want, to, I want us to be able to, to discern between the spiritual and the fleshly here. So when Jesus says that they shall hear the voice of the Son of God, this is red letter. In your Bible it says, the Son of God in red letters. You should underline that, right? Why is he called the Son of God? Well, in Acts 13, like I said, it was fulfilled that Jesus was raised again, right? Uh, Revelation 1, 5 says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten from the dead. Now, I, I, I've seen a pattern in the Bible. And again, I don't want to oversimplify or overcomplicate this, but I have discovered a, a little bit of a pattern with when it talks about the Son of God, it's usually, or a lot of times, it's dealing with the resurrection of Christ. It's dealing with He would be known as God by the fact that He would resurrect. And He is called the begotten, the only begotten Son of God. There's only one person that walked the earth, the man Jesus Christ, that died and was resurrected to live forevermore. Mind you, there were many resurrections in the Old Testament, and they died again. There were resurrections that Jesus rose Lazarus and he died again. His body's in the grave. He's in heaven, right? Even those that when the graves were open while Christ was on the cross, those people died again. They are, it was not an everlasting resurrection. It was a one-time event. Uh, in, in this chapter, he talks about that the Son can quicken whom he will, just as the Father does. He's talking about bringing somebody back to life. Jesus, as the Son of God, being equal with God, had the power to walk through the streets and heal the lame, forgive their sins, and raise them from the dead. The term Son of God seems to deal with sort of his uh, responsibilities and his ministry that's slightly different than that of the Son of Man. But I don't want to separate the two because you've got the Son of Man and the Son of God in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't have one without the other. And if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, well, then you've got a problem. You're not saved. Or if you say, well, he was the Son of God, but he wasn't the Son of Man. So you don't believe he came in the flesh. You don't believe that you believe he was just a spirit, right? So these doctrines work together perfectly. They go hand in hand. But John 5 is very unique in this. It gives us the title out of Jesus' mouth, both Son of God and Son of Man. Look at verse 26. Let's continue. He says, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Now here he begins to separate and show the distinction between the Father and the Son. The Father has life. The Son has life. It's been given to the Son. Whom? By the Father, right? So obviously there's a distinction there. And we're not focusing on the distinction between Jesus and the Father tonight, but it's all through this chapter, okay? Uh, verse 27. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man now this is very interesting because jesus was never uh, as the son of god he was never created we know jesus as a baby was born in a manger in flesh but the son of god was never created he has always existed he's eternal i mean that phrase the son of god is found all throughout the bible old and new testament and the son of man is as well so it's important distinctions but there are many more titles for jesus than just this there are many more titles i mean the lamb of god the uh, the light of the world uh, i don't have a list of them i'm sure if i asked for volunteers everybody could give me a different title to help us understand who Christ is, the Redeemer, the, the Holy One, the Seed of David, the Seed of Abraham. All of these things are to help us understand who God is. And it's interesting that God decided to demonstrate him, Himself to us through the Son. 
I imagine that if God the Father showed up in, in all of his awesome glory and might and power, my little human brain would not be able, I mean, it would just explode. It would just crush upon itself. I would not, I would have too many questions. So I don't, I don't get, I, I don't, how's this work? How's that work? Whoa, you know, I would, I'd be scared, number one. I'd probably be overwhelmed with the sheer power and the force in the creator God. And God expressed himself. He came to earth as the son of God to demonstrate his love for us by as God choosing to die for us and come back and show us this resurrection. The resurrection is key to all of this because we look forward to a resurrection. In this passage, he's talking about life, everlasting life. Your body will die one way, one day. I don't know when it is, but God does. And when your body dies, who you really are, your soul and your spirit, they'll last forever. You, in the essence of who you are, your personality, your intellect, your humor, your memories, all of those things is who you really are. The shirt on your back is nothing. It doesn't even represent you. It's probably got somebody else's name on it, doesn't it? Let's be real, right? So we're, we're blinded by the elements. We're deceived by our own eyes. We judge unrighteous judgment because we judge by appearance. And so Jesus, as he walked the earth, being both the Son of God and the Son of Man, he very uh, skillfully selected the titles of which he referred unto himself. Some, he would say, the Son of Man, demonstrating that you're looking at flesh, but this flesh will die for you and redeem your sins. Or you're looking at flesh, the Son of Man, and I will come back in great power and resurrect you. Here is the one very unique place where he says in verse 25, they'll hear the voice of the Son of God. And in verse 27, he says that he is the Son of Man, speaking of himself. Now listen, uh, he doesn't have a split personality. In fact, he ever probably has more wisdom and clarity and peace than anybody that's ever been created being God. And being uh, God is love and Jesus is light and love and everything else. So I want to just show a few passages that highlight this distinction so we can better understand the nature of God and the purpose of the fulfillment of prophecy for the Son of Man, and then also for the Son of God. I want to show a few places. Uh, start with Luke chapter 1. If you would, go to Luke chapter 1. And again, we're going to see how this uh, man, Christ Jesus, walked the earth. He was the seed of flesh. He had blood like you and I do. He had eyeballs and hair and skin. He had to clip his nails. He had to wash his feet. I mean, he had to, and well, stop right there. Use your imagination. He had to eat like we do. He got tired like we do. He was wearied. He was worn out. And yet he was able to do some miraculous things by overcoming the flesh. So it's important to understand that the man Christ Jesus, he is like us. He is that seed in the flesh that walked the earth. I want to learn what we can about the nature of God through the Bible because titles matter. The titles of God are distinct for a reason. If the name God was all we were given, it would be way too mysterious. And listen, some things are mysterious. I get that. We are not going to be able to unravel all of the mysteries of God and the Godhead and the Lord Jesus Christ and how it works tonight. But we're going to take a glimpse and see why words matter and how these titles matter in what Jesus teaches us about himself through the word of God. Now you're in Luke chapter 1. We're looking at the birth of Christ. Look at verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. Now here he's talking to Mary. And he's saying, Mary, you will have a baby. You'll have a son. Now here, now notice the word son is lowercase, S-O-N. This is the son of man. He says, behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Right? He's highlighting that it would become it would a baby coming forth from her human flesh, the son of man. Verse 32, he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. Now wait, who is the Most High? God Himself. So He says, He will be called the Son of the Highest. Now here's a reference to His Godhead. Notice S is capitalized. H is capitalized. This is a title. He shall be great and called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David. That also, the son of David, is another fulfillment of prophecy dealing with the Godhead. Look at verse 33. 
and he shall reign over the house of Israel, I'm sorry, the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said unto the angel, How shall this thing be? Seeing I know not a man. Now she was a righteous woman. She was a virgin. She waited for marriage. She protected her purity. She uh, maintained what God expected. And of course, God rewarded her for that and blessed her for that. Verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So first he says, Mary, you're going to have a son that will be in the flesh. And then he says, he will be the son of the highest. He will be called the son of God. Go to John chapter 9. So in this, when those titles are used, when he says the son of the highest, or he says the son of God, he's trying to say, listen, you're going to have a baby. And that part is natural and normal. And she said, well, wait, not so, not so fast. I haven't known a man. I'm not married. I've, I've never uh, 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 had a, a physical relationship, right? And so... He says, don't worry, this is going to be of God. It will be of the highest. It will be of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, it will be called the Son of God. Because God himself is the father of Jesus. Joseph was not. So he makes some distinctions in this area. And again, I think these titles, just to simplify it for you, I think the, the distinctions between Son of Man and Son of God, it kind of deals with his responsibilities, if you will, or his ministry while on earth. And although uh, Jesus had one ministry and one goal and one purpose and all of the little things that he did while he was here worked together, moving toward that, some of it was fulfilling prophecy about the Son of David, the Son of Abraham, the King of Israel, you know, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. So all of these titles work together in unison, and yet we still see a distinction in the portion of prophecy that's fulfilled, especially when Jesus himself, out of his own mouth, decides to use a different title, when he calls himself something different. Now, he did use the phrase of himself, the Son of Man, more than any other title, I believe. He rarely used the title Son of God, and so uh, this is nowhere near exhaustive, but I want to look at a couple of these where he calls himself the Son of God, and especially where we see in contrast to the Son of Man. You're in John chapter 9. Look at verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God, right? Now, this is where he had uh, healed the blind man, I believe it was, in this story. And, uh, you know, they, they question him, they grill him. He didn't even know who it was. And Jesus comes up to him and he says, do you believe on the Son of God? He's grilling this guy. He's asking this. And he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe it? He said, who is the Son of God that I might believe on him? Right? Very interesting question. Who is the Son of God? Well, he's standing in front of him. He says in verse 37, and Jesus said unto him, thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Look, only God gets worshipped. Only God gets worshipped. And when the Son of God is equal to God, and yet distinct from the Father, this was a very unique situation. If the Father came up to this blind man, whether he had eyes or not, he would know that this was God. And yet Jesus, as the Son of Man, came up humbly, healed him, came up to him and said, hey, do you believe in the Son of God? Who is the Son of God that I might believe? I am Him. And He said, I believe. And He worshipped Him as God. Verse 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see might not see, and they which, I'm sorry, they which see might, uh, let me start over, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. He said, the Pharisees think they can see, but they're really blind, and I confuse them, right? But you who were blind, I'm come to open your eyes and show you who the Son of God is. Now, when he calls himself the Son of God in verse 35, he defines the purpose of the Son of God. He says in verse 39, for judgment, I am come into the world. One of the aspects that we see with the Son of God is judgment. It is God himself that we have to answer to. It is God who judges us on a daily basis while we're on the earth, but especially in eternity. 
It's that eternal judgment that some fear and others look forward to. I like, listen, I look forward to it not because I'm perfect, because He's merciful and kind. He's forgiven my sins. He'll reward me for my time while I'm here. I look forward to the judgment for that fact. There's still many things that we all could get better and do more while we're here. He made that distinction. Why, why is the Son of God here? For judgment. Go to John chapter 10. Go to the next chapter. The Son of God, he's trying to teach us, is our creator. He's our judge. The Son of God has power over life. And of course, the resurrection of life. You're in John 10. Look at verse 24. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because you're not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Paul's here for just a second. I love this verse. I use it every time I'm preaching the gospel to somebody. This is an essential doctrine verse. It's very important for us to have this verse. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. He's saying you're going to have everlasting life. You'll never die in the spirit. You won't go to hell is what he's teaching here. But my sheep will be in my hand, and no one can take them out of my hand. He says you're not my sheep. Why? Because they don't have eternal life. Well, how do you get eternal life? It says, because you believe not, in verse 26. Because they didn't believe the record that Jesus came. He did miracles in his Father's name. They rejected him. Look at verse 29. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. What controversy when he says this one line. I and my Father are one. Are one. Some people look at that and they don't know what it means. Others look at it and they make assumptions. I know there are people that have made strange doctrines off of this, but you know, First John five seven, these three are one. One what? One God. He says, "I and my Father are one. We are God. I am God. He is God. The Father in heaven is God, and I am God. And I've come down here to manifest myself as the Son of God to demonstrate the power of God over salvation and eternal life, resurrection, forgiveness of sins. Like He came with the whole package, and yet He walked in the flesh, in the form of a servant, as the Son of Man who was wearied and tired and beaten and bloodied, that laid His physical life down for us." It's so important. I and my Father are one. One God. Verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Man, didn't this just happen in chapter 5? They wanted to kill him. Here in chapter 10, they're ready to kill him again. I think it happened in chapter 8, right? Uh, we're not there tonight, but I look at verse 32. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Isn't this the same accusation that we just heard in chapter 5? Because you're just a man. I see your flesh. We can see you're a son of man, right? Uh, what was the prophet? Was it Ezekiel that uh, constantly referred to himself as a son of man? Hey, I'm just a man. I'm just flesh. I'm lowly, right? Well, Jesus came as the son of man, as a title, and as the son of God. And he says, you're just a man and you're making yourself God? Notice it said that they wanted to stone him for blasphemy. Now, blasphemy is a statement if I got up here and proclaimed I was Jesus. You should stone me, okay? If I got up here and said things that were not true against God and lied against God intentionally, you should stone me. I'm blaspheming God. And so that's their intention here. You're saying, well, you're making yourself God. You're blaspheming by saying that you are the Son of God, which equals God. But of course, as we read earlier, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus is equal with God. He is God. Mind you, the Father is still equal as God. They're both God. They are one God. We don't believe in polytheism. And I know there's a 
whole debate on online now. It's like, well, do you believe how? What do you believe about this verse or that verse? Oh, you're a polytheist. No, I'm not. I believe in one God. Well, do you believe that Jesus had his own will and his own emotions? Well, yeah. And it's like, oh, you're a tritheist. You know, no, I believe in one God. You know, so there's this whole debate over that. I don't even want to touch that. I just want to look at the distinctions between Son of Man and Son of God. I want to understand why Christ chose these terms at different points, and it's in red letter. It's very important. Look at look ahead. Look at verse 36. Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. Now, if you're looking at the context here, we just read it. He doesn't say I am the Son of God in here, does he? Where did he say in this passage, in John chapter 10, where did he say I am the Son of God? Where does he say that? Back in verse 30, was it? I and my Father are one. When he said that, they said that's blasphemy. He says in verse 36, you want to kill me for blasphemy because I said I am the Son of God? Isn't that interesting? Go to the next chapter. Go to John 11. Go to John chapter 11. I'm going to try, try to make as much time as I can tonight with as many verses in John chapter 5, but this doctrine is now being introduced in John chapter 5. We give out copies of John and Romans, and uh, I encourage new believers to start in the book of John. It'll help you understand who God is. It helps you to learn the difference that there is God in heaven, and yet God came down and died for your sins. And how does all that work? Well, here in John chapter 5, he begins to reveal this information for us and give us a better understanding between the difference between the Father and the Son, but also the ministry of the Son of God and the Son of Man, all fulfilled by Jesus Christ while he was on the earth. In John 11, this is where it was Lazarus, of course, and he dies and he gets raised. Uh, again, I think Son of God often deals with the resurrection and the judgment. Uh, look at verse 4. John 11, verse number 4. When Jesus heard that he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now this is important. We're going to look in just a minute where he talks about the Son of Man being glorified. We're going there next, so just kind of put that in the back of your mind. So how here is he saying that the Son of God will be glorified through the death of Lazarus? He said, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. The Son of God is glorified through the resurrection. He is the only begotten Son. He is the first begotten from the dead. The Scripture was fulfilled when He said, This day have I begotten thee when He rose again from the dead. It was, I mean, any man that dies, that brings himself back alive out of the grave, you might want to stop and say, Whoa, either this is a trick or this is of God. And that's what He was doing is saying, Listen, I am the Son of God. I am the very promise of redemption through the resurrection. Only God can raise the dead. Only God can forgive sins. And only the Son of God has raised Himself from the dead to never die again. He's alive forevermore. Jump ahead in John 11. Look at verse 23. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise in the resurrection at the last day. Now look, Martha had some confidence in his salvation, didn't she? She's like, I know he's saved. I know he'll be resurrected in the last day. I know I'll see him again in heaven. I know he'll last forever. But in the meanwhile, his body is dead. Jesus says he'll rise again, right? Uh, continue in verse 25. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection. Now, when Jesus claims to be the Son of God, when he claims to be the Christ, the Messiah, think of this phrase here. He says, I am the resurrection. And notice he does that. I'm the resurrector. He says, I'm the resurrection you're looking for. I am the one that forgives your sins. I have power over life and death. Again, verse 25, Jesus, Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Look at her answer. Do you believe I'm the Son of God? What's she say? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come in the world. The phrase Son of God is unanimous with the resurrection. When Christ said, I am the resurrection, he's saying, I'm the Son of God. 
I am God come down to resurrect. Go to John chapter 12. Go to the next chapter. Say, so what is the distinction between the Son of Man? We're not going too far down that rabbit trail tonight. I just want to look at a few more passages that show and highlight the difference, and then we'll finish up uh, a little bit more of John chapter 5 tonight. Uh, but I do want to see this distinction. Again, you know, he's speaking to the flesh. I am in flesh speaking to flesh right now. You follow me? Although I'm speaking from the Holy Spirit, spiritual things. So they're spiritually discerned. Well, Jesus, when he used the name, the title, Son of Man, I think he's trying to highlight that he in flesh was speaking to flesh, but doing it being 100% God. He, I mean, he was veiled by flesh. They looked and they're like, are you sure about what you're saying? I just see a body. I see a man. I see an average guy. How is it you're claiming all of these great things? And all the more, they probably wondered, how are you doing all of these great things, right? He's speaking to the flesh from his flesh while proving his deity. When Jesus called himself the son of man, a lot of the times it's like, it's like he's reading your mind. You're seeing the flesh. And he's like, yeah, I'm a body like you are. And yet I'm showing you that I'm 100% God. This is what's often called the God man. I don't use that phrase a lot, I mean, but it makes sense. You're 100% man, 100% God. He had it all in one being, in one person. You're in John chapter 12. Look at verse 23. And Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, wait a minute. When he says the Son of Man to be glorified, notice we just saw in the last chapter that through the resurrection, the Son of God would be glorified. Here in the Son of Man, he's saying the time has come for me to die on the cross. And he's calling that glorifying the Son of Man. The, the Son of Man was glorified in death. The Son of God is glorified in resurrection. Again, verse 23. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now, Jesus is called the first fruits of them that slept. He is a first, uh, first fruits of kinds of creatures, is a first type of creature. What he did in his resurrection, he became a new form of a body that no other man has ever done. A, a fourth dimensional being, if you want to get technical, fifth dimensional, right? Which obviously being God, he encapsulates all the dimensions. But he's trying to teach us something about the resurrection. He uses the analogy of a seed. Hey, are you <coughs> storing your seeds? Because planting season is coming. You can't just take a seed right out of a tomato and put it right into the ground while it's still moist. That seed needs to wither and die. And Jesus is saying that of himself, that the Son of Man will be glorified when he dies. Well, that seed comes back as something much greater, doesn't it? Like the Son of God. So Jesus is using these illustrations to better help understand the aspects of the titles that deal with him. And it says, it bringeth forth much fruit. In 1 Corinthians 15, stay where you're at. I want to read a couple verses from 1 Corinthians 15 for the sake of time. Uh, verse 38, it says, But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. So he says, your body is a seed, and it must die. And then one day you'll be resurrected into something mightier and greater than uh, you could ever imagine. What I see now is just the potential for what your spiritual resurrected body will be like, right? Uh, he also tells us that there are celestial bodies and there are terrestrial bodies. Terrestrial is the terrain, the earth. We are earthly. We're from Adam. Yeah, well, you're born again. You're of the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. You now become a celestial being. You're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. We have an earnest payment, if you will. One day we're going to be greater. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 42, he says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. He says, listen, you're in a body that's corruptible, that's falling apart and decaying. One day you'll have an immortal body that will never decay. It will be perfect and sinless. He says in, verse, he says in 1 Corinthians 40, uh, 15, 44, It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Uh, he's trying to teach us something about ourself. And the more we study about the Lord Jesus Christ, the more we can learn about ourselves. 
He says in verse 49 of that chapter, he says, And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. One day you will have a celestial body, a heavenly body, a spiritual body, a supernatural body. It might look similar to an angel, but yet different and distinct. Not just as an angel, but something very unique. We have something to look forward to in the resurrection. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach us. As the Son of God, He has the power over the resurrection. As the Son of Man, He laid down His life for our sins, being that perfect sinless sacrifice, to redeem us from the corruption that's in our flesh. You're still in John 12. Look at verse 32. And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. He's saying, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. He says, when I'm put on the cross, I'm going to die for the sins of the whole world. That's what he means here. He said, signifying of what death he should die. The people answered him, we have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou? The Son of Man must be lifted up. Who is this Son of Man? What an interesting question. Didn't they? Or it wasn't earlier they were asking, Who is the Son of God that I may know? Right now, now here's the question. Well, who is the Son of Man? I thought Christ was going to live forever. I thought God was eternal and everlasting and couldn't die. Yeah, he says, The Son of Man in my flesh must die. And the Son of God will resurrect and give you power, eternal life, power beyond the grave. Go to Romans chapter 1. Go to Romans chapter 1. We're not far from getting back to John 5. Again, I don't want to overcomplicate it or oversimplify it. I believe there's some good, clear passages that teach both Son of Man and Son of God, helping us see the value in understanding the two doctrines. Also, it's important to understand why He called Himself the Son of Man. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Right? He who knew sin became sin for us. He was in the flesh, 100% man, and yet proved that he was God, the Son of God, when he rose again from the dead. He was the first begotten. You're in Romans 1. Look at verse number 3. Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Now wait the seed of David, according to the flesh. Mary's lineage was that of, well, it comes from David. He was in that line. He had a physical lineage. If you look back from years and years and years ago in my family, well, he's from the, the seed of John from you know the 1700s, that John Fannin or James Fannin, and he's got these other men in his lineage, right? Well, Christ had a physical body. He was of the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. Those were fulfilled in the flesh. Hebrews 2 gives us some insight. It says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. When Christ came into the world, he didn't come in looking like an angel with the nature of angels. He says, But he took on him the seed of Abraham. He's saying he came in a body. He came in flesh. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. It wouldn't have worked. If the Son of Man uh, wasn't man, then it wouldn't make any sense, would it? If the Son of God came down in an angelic, glorified body, it would be real easy to get people to believe on Him. But He came as a man. He did the miracles of God. He preached the Gospel, and people got saved. He healed people and forgave their sins. Look at Romans 4, 1. So we see in, in verse 3, it says, His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. How did he get that title, Son of God? By the resurrection from the dead. Go to Philippians chapter 2. We've quoted it twice, but we should go there and look at it. Go to Philippians chapter number 2. Move forward just a little bit. He as God, the Son of God, was also 100% the Son of Man. Totally flesh like we are now. A mind that has thoughts, as we do. And yet, because He's God, He is perfect. He was able to not sin. And thank God for that. That He came as a substitute for our sin. A propitiation to redeem us from the punishment of sin and from the power of sin and, and, and the life 
that we shouldn't live. Now we have an option. Before we didn't. Before we were a servant to sin. Now we've given the spirit of holiness and the spirit that we can live holy for God while we're here. We have power that we didn't have before we were saved. We see that in these two titles. Philippians 2, verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Now wait, he's God. Yeah, he was the image of God, the fullness of God. And he came in the likeness with the appearance of man, the flesh of man. He was made like a servant. In fact, he came and he served people, didn't he? He served people. He came to serve his creation that he would save. And that's hard for us to imagine. You know how many people came and uh, cried out and glorified Him and worshipped Him and gave gifts to Him, right? I mean, and, and so it was. And so will we one day. We'll bow the knee. And yet one day He will gird Himself and serve us. That's the Spirit of Christ. And we ought to follow that. That's Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, right? Uh, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made Himself of no reputation. He says, you want to be like Jesus? Make yourself of no reputation. You don't need a reputation. And took on him the form of a servant. Why don't you serve others? Verse 8, and being found and fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Go to John chapter 5. Go back to John chapter 5 where we started. When God walked the earth as a man, He humbled Himself. He served others. He didn't go out making a reputation. How many times did he heal somebody and then say, you know, don't tell anybody? And they went and told anyway. He wasn't looking for his own glory. He wasn't bearing witness of himself. He was just doing what the Father had told him to do. He was fulfilling prophecy. He was being led by the Spirit to help people. At the end of his life, you think about it, he died on the cross and that centurion, as he sees these things come to fruition, he, see, he, he sees all this and he says, truly this was the Son of God. Even in his death, there were such great miraculous events that made it evident that this is the Son of God. No man has ever died and caused these earthquakes and the, the signs and the visions and people coming up out of their graves that truly this was the Son of God. What a miraculous thing. Every knee will bow one day, one way. Back to John chapter 5 where we started. Look at verse number 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For whatsoever things he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Now Jesus is teaching us some distinctions between he and his Father here. And he says, what he seeth the Father do. So Jesus sees one thing, the Father sees another. The Father does one thing, the Son does another. Verse 20, for the Father loveth the Son. The Father loveth the Son. Man, oh man. Those that say that the Son is the Father, they're confused. Read these verses. The, the Father sees, the Son sees, the Father does, the Son does, the Father loves, the Son loves us. He says, the Father loveth the Son and showeth Him all that Himself doeth. And He Himself will show Him greater works than these that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom He will. There when it says quickeneth, that's, you know, you've heard the phrase the quick in the dead. And it means the living and the dead. If you're moving, you are quick. You have some energy. You have some life to you. You're animated, right? And he says the, the, he, he will quicken. He will give you life. He will not just give you physical life as the Father does, right? But He'll also give you eternal life as the Son does. Verse 22, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Who's going to judge us at the end of the world? The Son of God. He says He's given it all to the Son of God. The Father, we don't stand before God the Father when we're resurrected. 
We're not rewarded by God the Father when we're resurrected. We're rewarded and judged by the Son of God. The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. I love this verse. We were on our way to death and hell, the second death. We deserve to go to hell for our sins. And God loves us so much that He sent His Son, the Son of God, into this world. He was born of a virgin as the Son of Man. Jesus encapsulated all of these titles and fulfilled so many prophecies. Yet, Yes, there are some yet to be fulfilled, but He fulfilled all that He was supposed to. He finished His work on the cross. They put His body in the tomb. It says His soul was not left in hell. He put His blood on the mercy seat in heaven. That was the atonement for our sin. That perfect, spotless, sinless blood has been laid down to sacrifice for me. When the Father looks at me, He sees the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Son of God. The Son of Man died in the flesh, and yet while He was alive, He said, was it Matthew 24? He says, you'll see the Son of Man coming in clouds. Notice it's the Son of God we see being resurrected. And I show you these distinctions to help with better understanding. But listen, there's a time when you don't separate them. The Son of Man is the Son of God. Jesus will come back and He will, he will raise the dead up out of their graves. The Son of Man will come back and He will bring us back to life and we will be alive forevermore. Once we die in this body, this man, we go to be with God. And we will see the Son of God as He truly is. And we'll better understand these things. Until then, He gives us these little pieces of the puzzle to help us better understand His nature. Verse 25, again, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him all authority, I'm sorry, given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear His voice. If you notice in verse 28, it kind of covers both the Son of Man and the Son of God. They're both going to be saying it, but it's not because they're separate persons. It's one. When Jesus raises the dead, you can accurately say, that's the Son of God. And the guy standing next to him say, that's the Son of Man. And someone says, that's the Lamb of God. That's the Messiah. That's the Christ. It's the Savior. It's the light. All these titles apply. But yet there's still distinctions and uniqueness. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear His voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Understand this. Hell will one day be brought up and judged and cast into the lake of fire, and that will be the permanent home of hell. But until then, there is no getting out of hell. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. They will be brought up. They will be resurrected, but it's only for their hurt, for damnation. If you believe these verses and you understand that there is a resurrection unto life, ought we not tell folks? Shouldn't we be preaching this? Shouldn't this be a priority? You understand, when our body hurts, it's one thing. And it can be bad. It can be tremendously hurtful. But when your soul is suffering in hell, I grieve for that. I worry about that. There's people that it's easy for me in the flesh to go, well, I don't like their language. I don't like their upbringing. I don't like their outfit. I don't like their habits. I don't like their friends. I don't like, their, I don't like anything about them. That's in the flesh. What did Jesus do? He humbled Himself. He loved them. He died for them. Shouldn't we have that same attitude and follow in His footsteps? Love them enough to tell the truth of the Gospel. Love them enough to encourage them and uh, speak words of life and warn them that there is a resurrection of damnation coming and they will answer to God one way. Do it now. Verse 30 says, I can of my own self do nothing as I hear, I judge. 
and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Again, a distinction between the Father and the Son. Jesus was sent by the Father. Jesus has His own will. The Father has His own will. And yet it works in unity that it's only one God. That's mysterious. Boy, tell me about it. He's trying to teach us though. In 1 Corinthians 15, He says, And when all things shall be subdued unto Him, then shall the Son also Himself be subject unto Him that put all things under Him, that God may be all in all. And that doesn't mean uh, we're going to no longer have a son, but the son is subject unto the Father, and yet it's one God. Look at John 5, verse 31. Let's finish with this. He says, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Jesus came to teach us as much as he could about God, but also about ourselves, about our sinful nature and uh, the destruction that was to come. And uh, there's judgment coming for all of us. And look, we are judged every day. If you're a son of God, Right? He says, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Just as we are now a son of man, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you become a son of God, and you get victory over death and hell and the grave. I think that's one of the uniquenesses, unique things about this title is that the son of man means flesh and the son of God means God. And I don't become God when I get saved, but you know what? I conquer death and hell as Christ has. I'm given victory over my sin and over the grave for my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this passage. And Lord, I thank you for helping us to better understand it. Lord, I pray that you would give us that zeal and that fire. Help us to be a burning and a shining light and to go out and preach to others and help them get saved. Lord, we ask for the ability to do this for your own glory. Lord, I pray that you would bless our efforts this coming up Saturday as we have a soul winning marathon. Lord, I pray that you would give some increase. Use us, Lord. We love you. Help us to love the lost. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.